Shalom, good evening. I'm Jonathan Hassan, and this is yet another edition of TV7 Editor's Note. And today's program, we have a special guest, uh, as always, uh, the former Chief of General Staff of the Bundeswehr, the German Armed Forces, as well as the Chairman of uh, the Military Committee of the North Atlantic Alliance, NATO, uh, General Klaus Naumann, of course. Uh, it's always a pleasure to have you on Europa Stands now, uh, connecting, of course, to Jerusalem via uh, Uplink. It's, it's really a pleasure having you, sir. Pleasure to be here. Thank you. Well, uh, we start uh, this particular program with uh, prayer, and then we'll dive into a long list of topics that we can discuss on today's uh, uh, most pressing events. We'll try also to analyze a few uh, various challenges uh, that uh, I find to be quite important uh, to discuss. Uh, so how about all of you at home also join me in prayer, uh, and uh, uh, we will commence from there. Thank you, Lord, for today, Father. Thank you for the blessing and privilege of being able to uh, record yet another edition of TV7 Editor's Note, uh, together this time with General Klaus Naumann. Father, Lord, I pray that you'll guide and lead our conversation and that whatever we uh, say or do will be to your glory and will serve as a blessing to our viewers. We do so in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, General. Um, I would like to start with uh, a Short point, uh, I think uh, that uh, it, it's fair to highlight uh, prior to the, the Russian invasion of Ukraine, which obviously is still raging and is currently the, uh, the last war in Europe, um, there was a brief uh, campaign, a war in Kosovo, which you presided over uh, as chairman of NATO's military committee. Um, and uh, I think that there are plenty of lessons that could be learned, particularly from that campaign that uh, uh, could uh, still remain valid and should be uh, learned by the leaders today. Uh, one of those uh, points, I think, if I may uh, start with uh, two ministerial committees that were held uh, in uh, Strasbourg and in uh, Brussels. Uh, in Strasbourg, so of course, it was a European ministerial committee in 1998 and uh, subsequently a defense ministerial committee in uh, Brussels uh, that same uh, month, uh, during which uh, they, uh, those uh, leaders from the respective uh, EU member states as well as uh, uh, NATO members came together and asked you to develop together with uh, your uh, teams uh, a operational concept rather than war plans and operational plans uh, for uh, contending with the, the crisis at the time in Kosovo? Yeah, we were tasked in late spring 1998 to develop operational concepts for various options of uh, inter intervention in Kosovo since the situation began to unravel and it was very likely that at the end of the day, NATO would have to do more than to issue threatening statements that, they, that NATO would act. We had a period in which we issued one statement following the other and achieved nothing since nobody listened uh, to those statements and everybody believed in the entire Western world and in former Yugoslavia that NATO was a paper tiger who threatened but was not prepared to do anything since uh, obviously there were views among nations which prevented NATO from acting united and with one unanimous will. That was our big problem in spring 1998 and uh, it became, NATO became really the issue of cartoons which belittled the most powerful military alliance which has ever existed on this globe. Indeed. Uh, well, one thing that came to mind, of course, and this uh, uh, matter of NATO, of course, is, is also relevant today uh, with, uh, of course, uh, Russian President Vladimir Putin miscalculating um, 
fatally uh, miscalculating NATO's uh, composition, even though the, there were many questions even in the West. We heard French President Emmanuel Macron at the time calling NATO brain dead. Uh, so wh what is that lingering uh, perception of NATO that during times of peace suddenly uh, it's regarded as not necessarily relevant? Well, uh, the, the problem with NATO is that it has to act based on the consensus of now 30 nations. Um, it was difficult in my days when we had a maximum of 19 nations to achieve consensus. Uh, but um, consensus rule is well, the respect for the sovereignty of a nation. NATO is no supranational organization, it's an international organization. And as such, uh, it cannot impose the, the will of the organization to any nation. Uh, we have no other option but to follow the consensus principle, which of course is a big disadvantage in crisis management. In crisis management, time is of the essence. And if you're not ahead of the power curve, uh, the opponent who in most cases, like Putin now, is acting on his own will and is not sup uh, supposed to respect the decision of any free, freely elected body like a parliament. So NATO is at a disadvantage and has to get ahead of the power curve, has to win the initiative out of a situation of reaction. And I, I think that's true today for uh, the Ukraine crisis, although, as you all know, Ukraine is not a NATO issue. Uh, it's, an, it's a conflict between two sovereign nations, uh, Russia and Ukraine. NATO is supporting uh, the individual and fully legitimized right of Ukraine to defend itself, but it's not a NATO operation. If I, I can put the, the point that should be emphasized here, NATO's support of Ukraine is about the fact that if Russia wins, it will set precedent that will change the rules-based order of international law uh, the way we've known it in the last several decades. Uh, and therefore, when we're looking at this picture, neither side can truly win, but neither side is also capable of losing in this situation uh, because if either side loses, uh, it will change their whole precipice of, of their really reality on the ground. There you touch on a very important point. And I think at the true dimension of the Ukraine conflict, what it's all about is that we are possibly at, I should say, we are witnessing the birth of a new world order. Uh, the old world order which we cherished and which we were prepared to defend was based on the rule of law and on respect for the sovereignty of an individual nation. Putin's attack uh, challenged that and the old world order is now more or less in ruins. Uh, whether we will be able to restore the rule of law and the principles which preserved peace after World War II, I do not know. It's, I think, still open at this moment, but that is the true dimension of this conflict. A rules-based order that was founded upon the destruction of World War II, of course, with the reminder of never again uh, not allowing such a, a situation to evolve into the destruction of so many uh, nations, uh, including the murder of millions and millions of people. Uh, and uh, again, uh, I don't know many people who had no connection or their families not connected to this war in one way or another. Um, but uh, it seems like today, most generations, the young generations, don't really um, understand the gravity or the the potential re-emergence of such a reality that led to that war. Uh, is the educational system failing in this sense? I would not blame the educational system. I, 
I think uh, it is uh, the negligence of Western democracies to take into account the real dangers and to tell their people that we are living in a world which is full of risks and dangers and that we have to be prepared to act if, if our individual freedom as well as the freedom of our nations or alliances is uh, in danger. Uh, we, well, I think we got used to living in a world in which we believed, I'm quoting a German politician, that a country like Germany is surrounded by friends and doesn't have any enemies at all. Uh, that turned out to be a big mistake. Uh, and we, we had to learn, I think it in the hard way now, that the only way to make sure that the next generation will enjoy freedom and welfare and uh, a, a really a life in prosperity and, and happiness is if we are prepared to protect ourselves, to defend ourselves, and if necessary to act in order to make sure that no opponent can ever endanger us. Indeed, I, I think that uh, it's safe to say, even though it's still lacking, Germany happens to be one of the few nations in Europe that actually uh, stepped up its efforts to bolster its security and its uh, capacity to defend uh, its territorial integrity by uh, procuring pretty much everything out there, from infrastructure to uh, various capabilities. Of course, it's also engaged here in Israel uh, with uh, the government and the defense industry uh, in order to procure the Aero 3 system, which is uh, capable of intercepting uh, ICBMs or inter-ballistic uh, uh, missiles, uh, capable also of carrying nuclear payloads. Uh, so it is preparing for a scenario in which uh, Russia would potentially utilize nuclear weapons or other weapons of mass destruction uh, in the direction of the West uh, and, of course, would nullify that capability altogether uh, in such a scenario, uh, unless, of course, it is overwhelmed. So there, the systems need to be in, in substance and, and uh, quite uh, uh, large. But let's go to, to the point that you mentioned about uh, the uh, failure of Western democracies to really relate to their citizens the dangers lurking about. Um, among others, uh, your doctoral theses focused on the methodological problems of historical so uh, social analysis on Rom Roman society and antiquity, uh, something that, uh, of course, uh, has a lot of meaning to it. It's a fascinating topic indeed. Um, to what degree do you see the Roman society of ancient Rome uh, in a certain analogy, if you may, draw from that period to the Rome of the 21st century, the United States, which is supposedly uh, the leader of the Western world, uh, and uh, of course, powerful in, in uh, terms of historical terms, the most powerful nation to ever exist. Um, nevertheless, society seems to be fatigued by wars and, and fatigued by its, its role as the, the world's most powerful nation. Uh, which obviously challenges leadership to act in accordance with the interests of that country. Well, uh, I'm, I'm always a little bit reluctant to use historical analogies. I think we have to learn from history as far as we can, but we should not compare uh, a situation 2,000 years ago with today's uh, challenges. Of course, if one walks through Washington, uh, the analogy to Rome uh, becomes very obvious. If you walk down the mall and you see all those buildings which are definitely inspired by a uh, desire to uh, to be Rome once again. And uh, I think in, in Russia, some people called uh, on Russia uh, to be the second Rome uh, in, a, in a very different meaning. Uh, that's all interesting, but the the real core of the issue is that the so-called West, led by the United States of America as the most powerful nation in this Western alliance, 
developed a concept which I believe is worth to be defended. And that is that we are living in societies in which the individual enjoys the incredible advantage that the power of the law protects this individual against anything, even against the power of the own state. That is a form of civilization which had never existed before. And that is what we call the rule of law in a democracy. That's, I think, the best system which ever existed on this globe. It doesn't mean that we have to promote this more or less as a, as a system second to none, but that we should tell everyone we will protect this system since we believed. Well, we, you know, we believe after centuries of try and error that this is the best development we have ever seen. And we want to preserve it. And we offer it to others as a model they should study and then take their own decision what they would wish to do. We should not be, I should say, propagandists, actors, uh, in order to impose it on, on anyone. We cannot export democracy by, or we cannot impose democracy by the use of force. But we should tell everyone we are prepared to use force in order to defend our individual democracy. Of course, uh, there were attempts in history uh, to export democracy, including in 2002 uh, with the campaign of Iraq, among others where democracy was one of the, the attempts to basically um, assert it or, or impose it on, on the Iraqi people. But cultural disconnect ultimately brought about uh, to this uh, failure because the tribal societies presiding in, in the Middle East, uh, North Africa and elsewhere, um, are not necessarily uh, one people willing to relate to a national status, if I see it, at least from my perspective. How, how do you see that? Well, I agree with you. I think that was a, a big mistake uh, to, to make the attempt to impose uh, by the use of forced democracy on societies with a different uh, social development, a different religious development, a different history. We have to respect these developments in all parts of the world. And we cannot do anything else but to tell them, listen, we have gone through a very similar development like you are, right, uh, you are in right now. We have learned our lesson in that and that way, and we came to that conclusion. If you want to take this as a, let's say, as an example, uh, you are free to make your choice. But we should let this freedom, which we cherish so much, for those people as well, and let them freely make their choice. If they then come to the same conclusion as we ca uh, came to after, in the German case, 300 years of wars in Europe, then fine. But if they believe they have to make a different choice, fine with us as well. Unfortunately, I look to the West today and, and I'm concerned. Uh, I'm concerned uh, not only uh, because of the, the Western fatigue or, or to a certain degree, many people just don't care anymore. And, and that is, uh, it became very isolationist per not only nations, but, but uh, uh, individuals became very self-centered and centered in their own lives, which uh, to a certain degree is, is a certain utopia. Uh, to allow somebody to live within the liberal rights of uh, one individual. But it seems like um, as long as there is a, a cultural connection between peoples uh, within uh, boundaries of their own nations, uh, the, the understandings of way of life allow them to basically um, conduct their, their activities within the framework of laws and regulations that are put by Demos Kratos, the power of the people to uh, basically set the rules of their own uh, aspirations. And uh, I see more and more challenges to that 
uh, emerging, uh, not only because of migration, but also because of globalism to a certain degree, uh, in an attempt to uh, force a certain way of life on people, uh, which today seems to be not not as positive as initially thought. I think that's true. Uh, we we were believing that we could exploit all advantages of the so-called globalization, and in reality, we became so dependent that we obviously lost the possibility to act in a way which preserves our nations, our alliances, rights and legitimate demands. Uh, we have to learn from that. And that is something which we learned in the Ukraine crisis. When suddenly, uh, I take the German example, we had made the mistake to become dependent on Russian energy. Um, that's a big mistake which our previous government made, and now we are paying dearly for that. We have, Absolutely. We have to become independent to some extent. That doesn't mean that we have to abandon uh, everything which came as an advantage to us under the uh, world globalization. But uh, we have to protect our nation's well-being and welfare by preserving some uh, well, indispensable capabilities. I take the example of, of medicine. Uh, we became dependent on the world's pharmacy called India. We, could, mm. we couldn't produce any longer uh, some basic medicines. Uh, that has to be changed. Uh, we have to rebuild the capability in my country, Germany, to at least pro uh, produce independently some of the basic ingredients so that we can protect the life of our citizens. It's one of the lessons learned in this crisis, and we will do that. It will take us time, it will cost us money, but it's good for the well-being of our nation. Vital infrastructure, strategic infrastructure, uh, cannot be replaced and cannot be relinquished to third-party countries, uh, particularly in an environment that threatens uh, one's nation. Uh, of course, uh, I, I look at the Netherlands particularly, and here in Israel as well. Uh, the Netherlands particularly, 3,000 farms are about to be uprooted uh, by uh, a government that even though the, the majority party does not necessarily agree with that move, uh, the secondary parties, uh, the Hunlings, the, the left uh, uh, Greens and, and uh, uh, radical left organizations are trying to impose on the Netherlands all kind of uh, uh, policies that the European Union seeks to advance, uh, which uh, don't make sense because ultimately, if you move all the farms outside of the Netherlands, uh, how are you going to feed the Netherlands in times of crisis, among others? Um, and then here in Israel, when you look at infrastructure, at some point uh, they relinquished much of their arsenals uh, or the capacity to create uh, uh, infrastructure for, for weapons, for um, other tools, including agriculture, to Western societies. Even though Israel exports much of its Tomatoes, for instance, throughout the entire world, you see the cherry tomatoes coming from Israel, but the majority of tomatoes consumed in Israel proper come actually from Spain. So you look at the picture and you understand that something doesn't make sense here. And of course, everybody wants to make profit out of every circumstance, but sometimes uh, national interests should be preceded. And uh, to your point also, I think one of the main issues, cultural issues, including uh, the decline of Christianity in the West, I think, comes or or is um, rooted in the fact that Western societies forgot the principle of sacrifice. To have good life, to be able to preserve our societies as they are today uh, or as they were 10 years ago or 15 years ago, it has to come at a cost of sacrifice. And if we're not willing to sacrifice, uh, then all of it is for naught. 
Uh, in principle, you are absolutely right, and I couldn't agree more. Uh, but I would like to, to widen the scope a little bit. I think in, if I look at my own country, we are definitely one of the, uh, well, one of the nations in Europe which enjoys a maximum of individual freedom. But we understood freedom as the freedom to be not tied to anything. And that's a mistake. Freedom is, like I see it, a coin which has two sides. The one is freedom to be free, to be not tied to anything which we do not regard as uh, being indispensable. But the other side is responsibility, the responsibility to protect this freedom. And that is forgotten in my country by a large degree of people. Mm -hmm. uh, if we are not prepared to take responsibility to protect our freedom, then we will end in chaos and anarchy. And I think to some extent we are not far away from that. Unfortunately, so uh, we're drawing you to the end of the uh, program. We have roughly 30 seconds left. So I'd like to also take this opportunity to thank you, uh, General uh, Klaus Naumann, for taking out of your time to partake in today's edition of TV7 Editor's Note. Uh, it's always a pleasure, and I'm looking forward to our joint recording, of course, in Europa Stance that will air on the 28th of May later this month. So until then. As well, and thank you for that. Indeed, absolutely. And I'd like to thank all of you at home as well. Uh, and until next time, for yet another edition of TV7 Editor's Note from me here in Jerusalem. Shalom. about to lose the young people. They want a vision. They want to see solutions which may help them to believe that there is a future for them. Are we succumbing in a slippery slope uh, road to the major crisis? I don't know. The key issue is, is leadership and also maybe a lack of national self-confidence. For more of TV7's productions and editorials, we invite you to visit our website at www.tv7israelnews.com. 